gonna be on our side today. <laughs> God bless technology. <laughs> All right, there we go. Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany of the Speak Up and Inspire series. And today we are going to be talking to the beautiful Miss Lily Nicole of the Lowercase Leaders. Cedric and I were on vacation a couple of weeks ago in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we saw a protest going on for Black Lives Matter. And at first, we kind of looked like, you know, what's going on and trying to figure out, you know, kind of the scene. So we decided to go to dinner and we kind of went shopping. And when we came back, they were still out there. So that intrigued us. So we decided to stop to find out what was going on um, with this protest. And that's how we met Miss Lily and the lowercase leaders and several people, well, not several people, a nice large amount of people that were out there protesting um, in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, for me, I was a little cautious because I've never been a part of anything like this before, but for me, it was very humbling and very educational um, to be there to witness this, especially not ever being involved in anything like this before, but also to see so many different races that were there um in front of was that the city hall Ms. Lily? yes ma'am we are right on city hall steps we're referring to it as the city's front porch right okay because i was going to say something about front porch and i'm like no that's not the name of the place it was the city hall <laughs> um so it was really really nice to see um different races out there which made it even more interesting to me because when you know you think black lives matter you're not quite sure who is going to show up and show out for mm -hmm. something like this. Um, so I saw young people. I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of teenagers there. I saw um, older people. I saw a couple of seniors. I saw white people. I saw black people. I saw a couple of hippies. <laughs> um, I saw Asians. I saw, you know, straight people, LGBT people. So it was a big variety of people that were there supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. But even more importantly, they were um, supporting the lowercase leaders, which Miss Lily Nicole um, is a founder of. Now, are you the founder or are you part of co-founders? I'm definitely one of many founders. Um, the lowercase leaders is a community organization that was born from a protest, voiced by the community, um, bodied by the community, supported by the community, completely moved by the community. Um, we're completely representative of our community. And I'm glad that you pointed out that there are so many different elements out there that make up the community. We feel as though the lowercase leaders actually encompasses the community. It's not just the African-Americans, the minority populations. It is the older residents, it's the locals, it's the natives, it's the college kids. It is the artists, you know, the service workers. It's it's the whole community. And I'm, I'm just one of many people who decided to step up and like you said, step up and step out. Right, right. So um, I definitely want to talk about um, first, let's talk about the name, the lowercase leaders. Um, tell us, where did that name come from? Specifically, um, honestly, it came from uh, the original Sunday, what everyone refers to it as, you know, Bloody Sunday or the, the initial Sunday, which is May 31st the absence of any real leadership. If you went on social media regarding the protest that was happening on Sunday, no, everyone was like saying, don't go, we don't sanction it, we're not condoning it, we're not sponsoring it. But myself and quite a few of my other board members knew individuals who were going down there. For me, primarily, I knew a lot of younger theater people who are going down there. That's one of the communities that I'm very, very embedded with. And I knew they were going down there and I wanted to show support, but also I, I went down there in like a supervisorial aspect. I wanted to make sure nothing happened. Um, nothing happened to my community. Nothing happened to the building that I worked at. You know, there, there's a lot of elements that I was fearful of, but also that there just was no leadership. All the people who had names and titles and were representing organizations, they literally threw their hands up and they were just like, you know, we're not going, we have nothing to do with this. And 
through that we we came we didn't want leadership we didn't want you know the, this platform we didn't want this responsibility but we rose to it because we came together we leaned on each other the community came together with us and just gave us the energy and the encouragement and we just listened i, I feel as though for the first time in a long time the community felt like they were being heard to and actually listened and um, I'm, I'm just saying what they're asking and i'm reiterating their requests i'm speaking their their words for them and um i, I just I'm privileged enough that I have like an annoying enough voice that people are listening or a squeaky enough voice or a loud enough voice, you know, what have you. Somehow, some way people are listening and I'm just trying to make sure that the, all of the community's issues are being addressed. Right, so that leads to the second question. What are the issues that the lowercase leaders are addressing? What are you, what was the reason, the issue that started the lowercase leaders and then what now are your focus issues um the lowercase leaders uh, we we decided to solidify ourselves because we realized that there was a hole there was there was literally an absence of acknowledgement for the community <clears throat> we fought like the first week actually the first two weeks we kept saying we weren't going to do social media we weren't going to create a facebook you know that's not what we're here for that's not what we're about we're here to you know just collectively protest and make sure that our our anger is heard and our grievances are heard and we had that area and then the the cops were harassing us and annoying us and then you know the the named leaders were saying oh don't go down there it's covid you know you got to protect yourself and there was just so much naysaying and so much still unaccountability from people who have either been voted there or elected there or you know have been there doing it for a while we we noticed that there was just a gap a uh, miscommunication, a lack of connection. We noticed that there are bridges that have been built that people don't have access to, or people didn't even know that the bridge was there. And so we decided to permanent ourselves. So we applied for our 501c3. We put that in motion um, at June 9th, I believe is when we first reached out to inquire about how we can go about getting one, because we realized that our community needs us to stick around. This can't just be a collective gathering. Okay, we're gonna stay together for the protest. Nope, no, nope. we realized our community needs us to stay together for real. We are not reinventing the wheel. We're not trying to be another nonprofit. Like Wilmington has 1200 nonprofits. And so we're not trying to be just another nonprofit. We literally just want to get the wheel back on the axle. We want to connect the community to existing resources. We want to, you know, shine a light on services and affordability things that are there that they might not know about. We want to connect the 1200 organizations that are there for the community. We want to connect them to the community. Again, we're not trying to do anything new. We're just trying to connect everything that's already out there. We're trying to educate um, our platform. So be it is community education and outreach. So we want to literally outreach, extend that olive branch and connect the people who need the services and the people who are offering services, connect them to people who might be interested in them. Right, right. Um, I know that when I was there, um, of course, one of the big issues that you were addressing during that protest was the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and then I also met, okay, <laughs> I met Evan and Evan. I met one other young man. It was two. Um, there was one that was videotaping and then there was one that um, was representing the LGBT community. And both, so I know that there were the Black Lives Matter. I know that y'all were, um, it was mentioning about the, the trans movement um, mm -hmm. that was also taking place that same week that we were there. Yes. Um, and then I also heard you talking about youth, addressing the needs of youth in their community and also homelessness. So yes. you guys are, really um, targeting some pretty important issues that affect all communities. Um, but I want to talk about Wilmington. I've only visited there for vacation, so I really don't know much about Wilmington. So are you born and raised in Wilmington? No, ma'am. Um, my family is from the area. Uh, Duplin County is about 20, 30 minutes, right up 40. My mother's family is from there. Um, they, they all live there. They've been there for a while. So we used to vacation to Wilmington. I'm growing up, I've always been to Carolina, Fort Fisher area. So I'm mm -hmm. very familiar with Wilmington. I actually came here for college in 2012. Um, I studied at UNCW as a double major, theater and English. And then after graduation, I, like most people when you graduate, you don't really know what you're doing yet. So I just hung around, I loved the area, liked the area. 
Um, then I ended up getting a really good job. I, um, in my major, actually, I was the assistant technical director at Thalian Hall, which is Ooh. exactly what I went to school for to be a tech director. So it was perfect. You know, this historic building with all this experience. And I was one of the few artists that got a job in my field. And I was like, dude, I got to stay. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Then I met my partner at a, a homecoming. He too was an alumni uh, from UNCW and I convinced him to stay too. So we've been here now since graduation and we love it. Like I, I, like I said, I've always been partial to Wilmington because I love the beach. He, um, yeah. I, I convinced him to move back. He's from Greensboro. His family's there. And I was like, but Wilmington's here and I'm here. <laughs> so we were, <laughs> you know, he moved here to make uh, Wilmington his home, to make it our home. And so right. we, we've become tied to this area. Uh, we've found community members. We found a family uh, that, you know, you can't replace. I mean, blood is blood, right. but then your, your chosen family is different. You know, the people who step beside you or stand up with you those are the people who become real family and the lowercase leaders are actually that uh, from a hodgepodge again there were protests we all have come together and now we realize we do have a community like within each other we've become our own community right right okay that's nice i am <laughs> definitely i'm the reason why we were in wilmington is for the beach well unfortunately that whole weekend we were there it rained the whole weekend hey, so <laughs> we got maybe two hours of beach time while we were there which was one of the best parts of being there otherwise than, than taking part in the lowercase leaders uh, protest that was going on. That was the other highlight of our of our stay. So um, I know that with the lowercase leaders, you guys, when we met you, were not a 501c3. And so you guys were out there every single day. And I heard you say, we're going to be out here every single day until. So how were you able to make this happen? Like um, I, I, I thought it was like a simple answer. I was like, you know, we just went and applied for a permit, but I've been talking to a couple of, uh, of the leaders in the community. And again, not like the named, like uh, the elected leaders. When I say right. leaders of the community, I'm referring to, again, the foot soldiers, the gentlemen right. and the ladies who have been doing this. And, you know, they've been fighting way longer than I've been alive or, you know, way longer than they should have. Um, and I, I've been getting a lot of wisdom and advice from them. And, and they're just like shocked at the existence. I, I was speaking to a gentleman today, um, Mr. Abdullah, and he said, we're, we're doing something that's never been done before in Wilmington. Like we've literally occupied Wilmington. You know, we've occupied the city hall. So I do refer to it yes. as a city on porch because that's my house now. Like I'm there at <laughs> eight in the morning and I set up my tents. I take meetings there. I, we got rocking chairs out there now. So we're literally <laughs> filling. Um, if you drove by today, there was literally a clothesline hung from not the columns because we found out we can't hang on the columns. So we made our own rigging and we hung a clothesline and we hung signs from the clothesline. So I'm literally airing oh, wow. these dirty laundry. Um, yeah. Dude, it was as simple as going to get a permit and we got a permit because people keep harassing us. And <laughs> we got a permit to prove a point. Again, taking it back to that original May, the police officer said, our, when I say our, the collective community protesting, our initial infraction was the fact we were gathering without a permit. That is literally what they said our initial infraction was. We had an illegal gathering because we did not have a permit. And then of course, you know, we got into the streets and then they were like, oh, well, you're blocking traffic. This is illegal also. But they kept using the lack of a permit as an excuse. Right. And um, when we showed back up on Monday, you know, they were somewhat polite because you know Monday into Tuesday it still got really dangerous but again they were like there's no permit there's no permit so we actually had a really generous community member he got up one day I want to say it's maybe that Wednesday following that um, initial Sunday and he got us a permit from 7 a.m to 9 p.m till June 6 of 2021 so when I tell oh, you we're not going wow. nowhere for a year dude we're not going nowhere for a year like <laughs> we're there we paid our rent y'all gonna have to evict me <laughs> But yes, we, set up at, we set up at 8 a.m. every morning. We got our tents, our informational table. And then um, we break all that stuff down at 9, 9.30, pack it up in our trailer and turn around to it again the next day. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. So y'all have made a lot of important strides and everything since we've been there. That was a couple of weeks ago. You guys have accomplished a whole lot <laughs> yes. in a couple of weeks. Yes, um, okay. crazy. Yeah, it is. It's amazing, but that just shows that that someone is is watching over you, whether you believe oh, in God or, or in God is, uh, yes, they are <laughs> someone is watching God. over you and your efforts. I hope okay. all someone's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so when we were there, we saw that there was food. Yes. Um, we saw that there was water. So this is before you became an official 501c3. So you had a lot of support, I'm assuming, was it from the people at the protest or was... Oh. Okay. It's Tell me about that. It's like <laughs> random community members. Like when I say that we were born from the community, we are supported by the community and we are voiced through the community. Dude, like we are literally supported by the community. I mean, knock on wood, we haven't yet had to spend any of our own money except for um, re-upping our medical supplies. Cause you know, we do go through just general wound care and then band-aids. People have blisters walking on their feet all day. Um, so that's that's what we've had to spend our money, our own personal money on. But no, ma'am, the, the community has stepped up um, from day one. Tidal Creek, which is our, our local co-op, uh, gave us ice, like complete ice uh, from the morning to the lunch. They do like ice refills all day. They donate fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables, um, little individual snacks and yogurt cups for our youth and for like, you know, our vegan people. They make sure we have vegan meals out there. Mm -hmm. Our dinner. Um, we have a schedule now, but before our schedule got together, random community entities would show up with dinner. Um, one of the first few days, actually, Fu Wang showed up with 500 wings. And I remember that was the most surprising because we're in the middle of like our protesting. And this is still early on. We're like yelling and shouting. And, you know, this is like yeah. a lot of my voice. And a gentleman pulled up and he's like, did you guys order food? And I'm like, looking around, I was like, who ordered food? He's like, I don't know. This guy just said that, that these are food for the protesters. And I'm looking around. I was like, anybody order food? And I remember yelling that and everyone's like, I don't know. And then you see this guy get out of the, the car with like giant trays. It was five trays. We had no idea what it was. And they set them down. We found out it was 500 wings and food wings had just delivered it. And that was just one day. Um, we have since had wow. sliced life that hooked us up with food. Um, we have had several entities downtown just literally swing by and drop us off dinner and not uh, trucks, trucks, chicken and fish. They have yeah. fed us gosh, at least seven or eight times just the past week, like three weeks. Like they, they again, they're right around the corner. It's a black owned business, uh, but it's not just the black owned businesses that are hooked up because Food Wings is a black owned business. Um, like I said, Slice of Life, it's a downtown delicacy that everyone knows about, but they've run by and they, they look out for us. And um, Islands, Islands has hooked us up with a lot of dinner as well too. Wow. All of it's been donated. Like people believe in the cause. They they believe in us and they're wor they're worried about us. They want to make sure that we have food. They know we're not going anywhere. They know we don't have time to go home. The right. water and the, the Gatorades, it's just community members driving by, dropping it off. Uh, we have snacks, individually wrapped snacks. We've got hygiene products that are being donated. We've got plates, cups, uh, hand sanitizer for days. We've got masks. Mm -hmm. We've had handmade masks that community members have dropped off and we've passed out. We've got the one-time use masks that, again, people have dropped off and we're passing them out uh, with gloves mm. on top of gloves. Again, so far, and we're at the tents, the tents that we have out there were also donated by the community. We haven't had to buy anything. I, I truly believe that the community wanted this and needed this. And yeah. we were just fortunate at the right time and the place to capture the, the momentum and the energy. Again, we didn't create this, like the, the world created this, the, the pandemic created this. We were just in the right time at the right place to capture this ball of energy and then to roll with it and do something with it. And the community is supporting us because they know that this is the fire that Wilmington needs. Right, right. Wow, that is, that is really amazing. Um, you told a story about a older Caucasian woman who used her body as a shield or as a I'm not, I, I'm I know I'm probably messing it up can you tell us that story <laughs> tell us that story please because it was it was really hmm listening to it I mean you know I've looked into my heritage and you know I have Caucasian in my family and I have so many other things in my family so when you were telling this story I was just thinking about like that could have been my grandmother um that came out here to be a part of this so can you tell us about that story briefly um yes uh, I think this is the right story but there's, there's this one lady she had been watching us on live for a while and um she commented and she she's you know been watching and following along and then one night uh things got a little bit hairy and she did come down and she she I don't want to say she's an older woman because, you know, that would be like over aging her, but I want to say she's like maybe mid fifties. So she's right. older than me and definitely has been through this beforehand. And she actually came down, she had like a little wrist brace on and she came like flying down on her scooter and stuff, but she did, she physically uh, has inserted herself on more than one occasion since then. I mean, thankfully things have got not gotten as hairy, but we have since 
had one or two more scuffles um, with the police officers, but she did. She, she physically came in and she threw her body in front of us, in front of us. When I say us, I mean people of color, um, mm -hmm. um, myself and a couple of our board members and several of our protesters physically put herself in front of us to stop the police officers. And her response was, I, I look like their grandmother. I look like their mother, I mean, depending on their age. And she said, if that won't stop them, then literally nothing will. And she is willing to do that because she realized that she's coming from a place of privilege. She said, I will literally stare them in their eyes and they're gonna see their grandmother. And I could relate to that because I too have white in my family. Um, the majority of my family is Caucasian. My mother's Caucasian, my grandmother is Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And listening to her and watching her throw herself physically in between myself and a police officer, I had that same thought as you, like that could have been my grandmother. I mean, it wasn't to, for other reasons, my grandmother would not have done that, but it could have been. And that, that commitment to what a lot of people think is our cause or that support of what a lot of people think is our cause mm -hmm. reiterates the fact that it's not just our cause. Yes, Black Lives Matter is a movement highlighting the atrocities that people of color face, not only at the hands of the police officers, but at the hands of the entire American system. But it's not a political statement. Black Lives Matter is a humanitarian movement and a humanitarian movement affects all individuals. Every single person alive and breathing needs to support Black Lives Matter because supporting Black Lives Matter is supporting systemic change. Supporting systemic change is supporting the growth and the elevation of humankind. And if you can't get behind that, then you are the problem. Bottom line, like the, the, this is something that is not a gray area. And I'm a, a very literal being. And like I said, I was a theater major. So I'm huge with intentional language and making sure mm -hmm. that what I'm saying is what I mean. But no way you paint it, no way you look at it, is there a gray area? You're either for the movement or you're against it. You're either racist or you're not racist. You're either for redoing a system built upon violence that reiterates violence, that instructs violence, that institutes violence, or you're against breaking down that same system. There's no gray area about this. I don't care your race, creed, color, or your age. Black Lives Matter is a humanitarian movement that goes far beyond Wilmington, North Carolina, far beyond the United States of America. It's, it trickles into other countries, point blank. It is a humanitarian concept that we need to invest in. Yeah, I know when the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement started, I was kind of on the fence because I'm a very big, I'm a very firm believer in claiming all of who I am. Um, yeah, so it was a little hard for me to say, you know, Black Lives Matter. So I was the one who kind of sat back and watched, you know, the movement become the movement. And mm -hmm. then you have people who come in and say, well, all lives matter. And I was like, okay, now that I can do, all lives matter, I can do that. But then I started seeing statements that said all lives matter all lives don't matter until Black Lives Matter. Yes. And so that is when I said, you know what? I can be on board with this because that's true. All lives don't matter if only certain lives matter. Yeah. Um, and so that was the education for me that I needed to be able to support because it's not that I'm saying that the Caucasian side of me or the, you know, Native American side of me or, you know, all these other sides of me are mm -hmm. valid, but it's saying that this part of me, the African American side of me is valid and that this is an issue that all of us, regardless of our race or our background, culture, or whatever, need to be a part of. Um, and so I'm um, I had to educate myself on this. So for you being, you know, multiracial yourself or biracial yourself, how was it for you joining this movement in the beginning? And then from, I would say from the beginning to the, you know, till now, has there been a difference in how you feel about it or? Um, <clears throat> so I, I too am, like you said, I'm multiracial. 
I'm the individual who has always proudly touted that I was multiracial. I'm the mm-hmm. same way. If I if I say this matters, then I'm denouncing this. Or if I say I'm I'm one ethnicity, then you know I'm I'm not caring for my other ethnicity. I again, mixed people have that 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 complex. You know, you just don't want to ignore something, but you don't, don't want to like not. Um, mm-hmm. I also was raised in white America, uh, so I tell people all the time. Um, I'm probably the whitest mixed girl you ever meet or people have referred <laughs> me as a black girl. And I'm like, I'm the whitest black girl you'll ever meet. My <laughs> family the same thing about white. me. <laughs> exactly. Like my whole family's white. My dad has married into white people. I do not have a whole lot of um, experience or history with uh, black America. And I've always said that, not that I don't want to, just I've never experienced it. So mm-hmm. I feel and felt completely unqualified to be <laughs> the forefront of this. Um, even from day one, when I woke up and my picture was all over the world, I was just like, no, I am not the face of Black Lives Matter. Like, I, that can't be me of all the people out there. But then I think back to, again, that Sunday and what motivated me to be able, or what encouraged me and what fueled me to be able to step up and have the conversation with Donnie Williams in the first place. What gave me the energy and then the concept to be able to negotiate with the police officers and get them to take their gas masks off you know what fueled me and it did come from a place of privilege um whether it was my white side or whether it was my um connected side i felt that god forbid if the worst of the worst happens and we've seen it like like we're protesting Mm -hmm. because of the worst of the worst but i remember hearing in the back of my head if that were to happen to me there's enough people watching this live feed. There's enough people watching the news. There's enough people whom I have a really good relationship with in Wilmington that if I went missing, they would make sure I'm found. They would make sure they brought enough of a stir. And that does come from a place of privilege. Um, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, if something happened to me, they would find me. I couldn't say that for everyone else. So I felt secure in being the voice of the movement. I felt completely unqualified to be the face of the movement. (laughs) Um, And then I started talking to the community members. And a lot of them I did know because I really do live in this community. Like I live just streets up. Uh, I'm there in the north side. I've been there for six years now. I was there during Hurricane Florence relief. Like I was walking around with a wagon, getting to know my neighbors and checking in on after Dorian, same thing. I'm out there cutting up trees. Like I, I have done the footwork. I'm at, so I, I've been low key an advocate longer than I've known, mm-hmm. but I don't know. It's still very, very surreal sometimes for me to accept and or take in that I have become one of the one of a prominent faces for the, the Wilmington movement. Um, it's ridiculously humbling. And I thank the community, honestly, every single day for, for accepting me, for welcoming me into their family, because it is like they, they brought me into their family. They, they trust me, they open to me, they, they tell me their stories. And I, I'm very, very humble and thankful. And I ask them all the time, you know, please make sure that I'm not disrespecting anything. Please make sure that I'm not over speaking. Please make sure that I'm not misrepresenting you guys because I'm not separate from them. And as I, oh, I'm not you. I just know that for my entire life, I've never 100% been immersed or knowledgeable of it. And I do not want to leave out something that's very important that by my own ignorance, I don't know. So I'm, I'm super open and I am, um, I don't want to say relying, relying heavily on, but I am leaning on a lot of the community members who have stepped forward to give me advice and to, to guide me and to, you know, make sure I'm handling the situation respectfully. And I'm, I'm super, super thankful for them. I, I've known them in other walks of life and in circles, but them stepping forward to make sure that I know what I'm doing, I really appreciate it. But also on that note, they're not telling me what to do. They're definitely guiding me. And honestly, they're telling me to continue being myself. They're con- telling me to continue on the path that I am and just keep speaking and keep the conversations going. And I, I'm thankful for that. So it, it's kind of, it's kind of surreal. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you noticed that at the protest, I, I really didn't do a lot of standing and the, the honks, you know, the, the horns were honking and the, the fist. I really didn't do that because I didn't feel comfortable mm-hmm. um, doing that. I was, I was satisfied with the fact that I was there and being supportive. Um, I was doing live footage for the podcast. I took some pictures. That was my way of being a part of it. Um, and that's, yeah. And I think that's just because, um, 
I don't feel that I'm the one that can say, I guess kind of like you. I mean, I was born in, I mean, born. I was raised in a community that was that was very mixed. So I didn't uh, grow up in a predominantly white neighborhood or predominantly black. It was mixed through, throughout my whole life, um, even now. So I did have, you know, I've 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 had the the, the black family experience, so forth and so on. And I guess I'm on the opposite spectrum, where, you know, me growing up, it it was. I'm black, my father's black, you know, my mom, sometimes you look at her, you don't know what she is, if she's white or she's yeah. black. Um, Cause you know, she's, she's um, multiracial too. Um, so I was on the opposite side of you. You grew up predominantly with your Caucasian side. I grew up with my African-American side and that's what I know, but I'm still, you know, they used to tease me in school. Oh, you're, you're a white girl. You're not, black. you know, so forth and so on. And all even now, time. my husband sometimes calls me, you know, these little names because I don't know all the black movies. <laughs> my partner has revoked my black card. He's like, it is under constant all review. All the time. Like, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, like, I'm like, no, I didn't see that movie. No, I don't. <laughs> or I don't so, even know that movie. Like, what are you talking right. about? Like, jaw drop. Let's pick it up. I don't know. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I have, I've had that experience, but I still do not feel that I could do, I, I don't think I could be the face of the Black Lives Matter movement, but what I can do is I can educate myself, and I can support others who are leading the movement, and I can, um, you know, educate my children and get the knowledge that I need so that I can be supportive, because I want to support my culture, um, so I really applaud you for for being the face, because I'm sure so, I'm sure when the police officers come and look at you, they're seeing a black woman. They're not necessarily seeing um, your Caucasian side. So, how has that been for you? Just um, being recognized. Just you're 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 African American. You're not my, white. My partner <laughs> was telling me there there was literally a span of time um, early on. As it, again, I say early on, like this has been happening forever, but it's only been four yes. or five weeks. It, it's really yeah. just a short span of time. But at mm -hmm. the beginning of all of this, my partner he literally would like before I'd leave in the morning, he'd hold my face and look at me. He's like, "Baby, you are a black woman." Yeah. And <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the first day I just like brushed him off, like leave me alone or whatever. But he's like, "No, no, no. I need you to look at me." He's like, "Cause the the the, the tempers were still heightened. The cops were still being aggressive, and there was still times like we just didn't know which way the things were gonna fall." And he's like, "I need you to know when they see you, they just see a black woman." And so that was a reality I had to accept early on. And I had to tell myself that, and I had to remember that because no matter how white I feel and no matter how white I sound or no matter how I identify, mm -hmm. those cops see a black woman, yeah. bottom line. Yeah. And that is a reality. Yes, it is. And I mean, that's, that's the same with, same with me. And I don't mind because that's, that's my culture. My dad was, was dark skinned, handsome, tall, you know? So I, 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 um, mm. I want to say grass, but I acknowledge all of all of me and all of the, my culture and all of my ethnicity, so forth and so on. Um, and even though you know I'm I'm light bright as people call me, and my children are are lighter than me with freckles, I'm still a black woman. And so um, you know when I saw you out there, I said, "Wow, number one, she's beautiful." But then two, you know, she could be my sister. She could be me because you know we we resemble as far as features and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really great to, and I think that that gave me some encouragement because since then I've been more involved and that took seeing you um, and mm -hmm. seeing you out there being a strong leader in your community. And I knew as soon as I saw you that you were multiracial or at least biracial. Um, and so I was able to identify with you. And I think that's probably a reason why, and you can correct me, why I feel that so many people are drawn to you and so many different races and so so many different people are supporting you along with your other you know, uh, board members and so forth is because they can identify with you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that you should definitely um, be proud of. And I'm, I'm very proud of you for being out there um, despite 
your your upbringing you're out there still representing as a black woman and i think that is that should be applauded all in itself so i really appreciate that <laughs> thank definitely. you very much i i appreciate it i i'm definitely learning more and like i said i i love it because i i haven't had the opportunity to learn about you know my black side I, it wasn't there my father yeah. is not really in touch with his black side either i mean he's mixed himself so he grew up right. in a very white-esque type lie if he's only ever married by people so again like just right. my 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 accessibility to black culture just wasn't there and i'm 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 learning so much of it now and i love it but I, i've always been open to learning and i would agree with you i do think that i'm relatable and yeah. people can see their self inside of me however they sway it they can yeah. something yeah. in me that they can relate to and i do like that yes definitely definitely um Let's talk about briefly, briefly the um, the fact that you are now a 501c3 in such a Wait, short right. period of time. I'm jealous, actually, because <laughs> it takes a long time to become a 501c3 and it actually discourages people sometimes because they feel like, you know, I'm paying this money and it takes so long and, you know, you're waiting so long. So I want to applaud you on that. So what was the deciding factor to go from being advocate, activist, protester on the on the front porch of City Hall to saying, you know what, we're gonna do this. We're going, we're going all out. The very first thought that we might need a 501c3, actually Harris Teeter reached out to us and wanted to donate. And they okay. asked if we were a nonprofit, you know, for tax purposes and stuff. Right. And we were like, no, actually, you know, we're not um, a couple of the local organizations stepped up they're like oh you can borrow our 501 you know you can go ahead and yeah. get that, that that cash that check and we're like it was still early on we were still filling people out you know the movement was still hot and we're like we don't want people to co-opt us we don't want people to try to like just <laughs> on to our curtails and we were like i don't really know like i'm super super annoyed i don't trust nobody and i yeah, was like yeah. i don't want to partner with anyone this early on and then got to the point i was like i think they just want to hang out with us because we're the cool kids right now you know we got like <laughs> we got the ball and people just went up in the circle and so we kept like pushing away and turning down the the assistance offer or the partnership offer and i was looking at our board and i was like all right guys um well it was even before our board we're just like the the, the organizers i was like right if we're going to get bigger money, if we're going to stay, if mm -hmm. we're going to push further for our community, I was like, we need to solidify this. So we need to decide, yeah. are we in this for the long run or are we in this for a good time? And we had those real life conversations. And I'm, again, I'm very fortunate. I, I know the, I, I say I have the most random Rolodex. Like I know people who know <laughs> people and I, I don't know how I know the connections, but you know, I put out my feelers and I reached out and like I said, I'm, I asked my CPA, because uh, I work in theater, so I have to have someone who does, does my taxes. Theater right. taxes and paid is so much different than just, you know, going to <laughs> get paid like with the W-2s. It's, it's crazy. So I reached right. out to them and I was, June 9th, like I just scrolled back on my text message. I was like, so we're kind of interested thinking about the possibility, maybe how could we, you know, just literally testing out feelers. And he's like, uh, let me look into it. I'll get back to you. And within a couple of days, he had called and had some ideas. And I brought it to our team, which again, we were just team at the time, our organizers. And I asked them their opinion. And everyone's like, do it, go forward. And like I said at the beginning, everything, our success, our gains are solely because the, the community supports us and knows that we need to be here. And we're fortunate. Um, June 9th was when we had the first conversation and we were official last week. So in under four wow. weeks. That and is amazing. Four weeks I acquired it. And and I do know how long it takes to get a 501c3 because I'm also the president <laughs> of a charter school. That's uh -huh. a nonprofit charter school. And that mm -hmm. took us almost a year to get that 501c3. Yeah, it takes a long the time. The hurdles and the hoops are hard. Um, our CPA told us it could be six to eight weeks before mm -hmm. we hear something back. But again, the gods are looking out for us because we got ours in under a month and we got a, a bank account. And so now we're able to get those bigger donations. Now we're able to partner with the larger companies. Um. And we didn't want to do it for ourselves. Again, we could care less about the tax write-offs, but having those numbers, we realized, gives us a level of authority that we wouldn't have had before as an organization. And it's right. actually come in handy. Um, past few weeks, we've had to use that um, authoritative sway, so to speak, <laughs> to navigate the jacked up system that we're protesting um, to advocate for some of our community members. Um, a lady got displaced uh, in a personal situation that she was dealing with and we needed to seek shelter, like emergency shelter for her. And she was calling and calling and they kept saying, oh, there's no rooms, there's no rooms, we're booked up. 
And I called and I was like, you know, hey, my name's Lily Nicole. I'm uh, the co-founder of Lowercase Leaders. It's a nonprofit. I'm advocating on behalf of my community member. I got your number. What can we do? And within like an hour of that phone call, you know, she gets her supervisor and all of a sudden, oh, we can get you a room. Yeah. But yeah. literally, yeah. you just told this lady there's no bed. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm learning that, you know, that nonprofit gives you a little bit more pull. And so it helps us advocate for our community. It helps us get those connections. It helps us get them taken seriously. So yeah, the, yeah. the push forward, it was a no brainer. We, we realized we needed to do it. So our community knows that we are there for them. We didn't want to be just another pop-up fly by night band-aid mm -hmm. picture. We mm -hmm. wanted to show them that we really were serious about staying with them. Right. Right. Um, what is, what's in, um, we're going to personal and then lowercase. So what are your personal goals going forward? My personal <laughs> goals, um, I want to establish two full-time paid positions within LCL. I want four part-time positions. I want two internships and at least two apprenticeships within LCL, um, all paid positions. That's my personal goal is to make that happen. So partnering with the big companies, putting my feelers out, having the conversations to make sure that I can solidify that. that that's my personal goal that I want for for the, the community, for the, 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 the organization, for my people. Nice, nice. Okay, and so for the organization, what are some of your, your goals for the organization? Um, we are in the process of starting a community breakfast program um, that will operate Monday through Friday, year round, free breakfast from six to 10 um, will be our operating hours and we're gonna be putting it on the south side. So that's one of our first goals. We are also in process of gathering and maintaining the community gardens that are in town. They've previously mm -hmm. been collected. So we mm -hmm. wanna like take them over, recultivate the earth, bring the community and show them how to do the earth and do the work and get the crown. And also we are advocating for the police. Um, we're, we're focusing heavily on the police departments. We want mandated therapy for them. We want mandated community policing. Um, an example, if you have an eight hour shift, we feel like two of those hours should be on your foot walking through the community, like that level of community policing. And we also want mandated local Wilmington history, not only in the police training, but also back into the school system. Like you have to know about the area you work and you live in, bottom line. Like there, there's no reason that the Wilmington riot isn't taught like the Greensboro sit-ins. Right. And, you know, like th there's no reason, like th it just blows my mind. So those are some of our immediate focuses from the LCL like organization side. Very good, very good. I'm excited for you guys. So I know that you said that you had some um, events coming up. Tell us what you have going on. One of the ones that we're super excited about, um, Chris Everett actually, he is the director writer of the documentary of Wilmington on Fire which is an amazing uh, film. He first debuted in Cucaloris, excuse me, Cucaloris a few years ago. And it has since been on like different film circuits. He's traveled around the world. It is an amazing documentary. If no one's seen it, you should come to City Hall on July 25th because Chris okay. has actually come to town and he's gonna talk to us. He's gonna rap with us. He's going to let the company or the community know like what it's about, why he did it. And we're gonna stream it. So you're gonna get a chance Ooh. to see it. And we're super nice. excited about it. Um, that is, that's a huge thing for a lot of people because again, it's a brief introduction into the history and it's so well done that if that's all you do to start your education, dude, I'm happy with that. Just start your education. Right. And what's the name of it again? I'm sorry. It's called Wilmington on Fire. On Fire. Got yes, it. Okay. And okay. another Got event it. that we're really excited about, we're actually partnering up with some organizations in town. It's still early in the development, but it's going to be a completely free community yard sale the weekend of the 17th through the 19th so it's actually coming up very soon but it's mm -hmm. going to be completely free we're currently accepting donations i think we're actually just getting it up on the website so or the facebook so we can start announcing and cultivating that but it's going to be on 1219 dawson street um friday saturday and sunday and it's completely free whatever you have wow. at your house right now whatever you're going through your clothes your pillows your couch you know you got an old stove you want to get rid of anything i mean people are in transition right now like they're still in COVID. there's a lot of mm -hmm. resources that they don't normally have availability to that they would have availability to so we want to put it all in just an outdoor space again socially distance responsible but we want to put it there and have the opportunity for people to come out and get what they need completely free like people still aren't working it's ridiculous people are hoarding things just bring it to us it's a giant yard sale for the whole community um so we're really excited about that 
That is great. That is great. Um, I know that you were saying early on that you were getting some kickback from the police. Has that relationship improved? And have you made some partnerships with, no. No. <laughs> we have. Tell us we about have, that. How is, how is that affecting what you are doing? And why do you think that you're getting so much negativity? Um, we don't know why, actually. We, we don't know why, but the higher ups in rank will not allow community policing. Um, when in moments of tension or when we've been toe to toe with officers, lieutenants and have literally commanded people to stop talking to us. Like they said, this is a direct order, stop communicating. Um, early on we had, or I actually had a direct line with two to three different officers where they gave me their work number. They were like, you know, text me, like, let's deal this out, let's work. And I have since been told, you know, all response have to go through so-and-so. So no, they've actually limited communication. They're like micromanaging things. Uh, we feel like our relationship has actually become more strained. They're not violent and aggressive, so to speak. Like they're not running up on us with, you know, grenades and, you know, smoke bomb, but they're limiting the interaction, they're limiting conversation they are citing us for the dumbest things. Like one of our board members got cited for vulgar language. Respectfully, I curse left and right. Almost every newscast in live feed has me like slamming F word and this, that, and the third. And he got a citation. And it's just like, they're arbitrarily enforcing the different police policies today. Today, for example, we had, like I said, our little laundry line strong and the police officer came over and told us, she's like, oh, well, I don't know if you can do that. Um, that the city hasn't complained about it. I'm waiting for a complaint, but I think they're waiting for us to do something. So I looked at it, I was like, are we in violation of anything? Has anyone called you and said that something was wrong? And she's like, no. But then she went inside, walked around, talked to them. And she's like, okay, well, yeah, they said that it's an issue now. I said, so you went looking for a problem. Yeah, yeah, she, so yeah, she they're, created they're an issue. Yeah, they're arbitrarily enforcing. So now with that stuff, like nitpicking, doing what they want to do, we went on our march she said that the decibel level for downtown is 75. She had her little decibel reader out. We were at 82 decibels. And I asked her, what did she want me to do? That was <laughs> yeah. with no megaphone. That was with no like sound amplification devices. That was just us talking loudly. Hmm. Wow. And I literally looked at it. I was like, what, the, what, the, what do you want me to do? Tell people to whisper on our marches? <laughs> It is a yeah, protest. it's kind of hard to have a protest and and talk about it's issues in the community. We're marching. Yeah. And her response was, well, you don't have to talk so loudly. There are some people in your group who are aggressively yelling their voice. <laughs> it's a protest. Respectfully, <laughs> honey, we could be burning the city down like other places. Like you, you just yeah. should be happy all we're doing is yelling. Yeah, yeah. You guys were very um, civilized. You were very respectful. Um, no one was yelling and screaming at anybody. Um, you know, people would go by and honk and everybody would put their hand up. No one was throwing anything. You, you cleaned up behind yourselves. The area was spotless. Um, so I think you guys are compared to other protests that we've seen and so forth and, or marches or whatever, you guys were pretty, pretty great. <laughs> which, was, which made, yeah, which made me more comfortable to come because Cedric was actually the one was like, you know what, we're gonna park and we're gonna go. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> and I, and I just It's like, you know say, what, can I just sit around the corner real quick? <laughs> I just want to say that, uh, especially at the end, the, um, I think it was the, the eight minutes of silence. Mm -hmm. um, that was like super emotional for me, but I, I felt like that was the best part. Um, and then, you know, we walked away and we walked to our car and we was just like, I'm really glad that we stopped. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, we, we were there, what, two more days after two, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one and a half days, but because um, I think we came to you on Sunday, we left on Tuesday, but the rest of the days we came by and honked our horns and made sure you guys were okay and no one was harassing you because one thing uh, I might not be want to be the face or feel like I'm going to be the face, but if I see someone that's being mistreated, I will do something. 
Exactly. Like I you're very big on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, so yeah. Now, and I meant to ask you this, but do you have accessible the eight minute um, reading that you did? Or yeah, the- what we were saying um, was actually George Floyd's uh, words. It was nine minutes of silence, and on every minute we had a different saying. And um, I actually do have it. I can. Okay. Hang up. Yes. Okay. So it was nine minutes and I, I was aware that it was for, um, George Floyd, but I wasn't sure if you had it accessible to you. So I wanted to say, was there anything else you would like to share with us? And if there is, let's talk about it. If not, then I wanted to end our interview with that because- um, I do. Uh, we, okay. again, through the evolution, we're like on week six now. And uh-huh. we have, um, with obviously schedules and themes and breakdown, but one of the biggest components of the growth of our organization is, like I said, it is a nonprofit and our platform is community education and outreach. So we have a structure now. Every single day, Monday through Friday, it's eight to nine. Saturday and Sunday, it's 12 to nine. From okay. eight to 12, it is our socially distant slash little protester time. Because again, COVID, COVID's real, man. People are scared to get out there and protest. Um, Studies are showing that actually the protesting is not spreading COVID. So, you know, people, it's safer. We're we're some of the safest people out there. Um, We have gloves, we have sanitizer, we have masks. Like we're actually doing it the safe way. But eight to 12 is socially distant slash little protesters where we have story time, engagement. They can make their signs. Um, We have masks that they can color and draw and personalize it. So it's a way for parents to get their children out there to understand and be part of it without risking their safety. From 12 to four every day, we have what we call our engagement session where we have an all call for people to come and talk and educate and engage with our followers slash protesters slash community members. And then four to five is our dinner break where we clean up and we flip the tents and we break stuff down. And then five to nine is protest and protest application. What we need is people, people from the community, people from afar, people to call in, to zoom in, to to fly in, to to spend the night, to talk on the different themes that we have, to educate our people. Our key demographic between 12 and nine is the the, the, the voters, uh, 18 to 35. In the first three weeks, we registered over 500 voters. So we have a demographic that is hungry for knowledge. What I need from the world and from the, the, the people at large is the knowledge givers. So on Mondays, it is <clears throat> mentor mentor Monday or m- mental help Monday, either one of those categories, because um, you know they can go interchangeable, but we want to get the most out of our week. So if you are a mentor of any way, a specialist in your field, or if you are knowledgeable of mental health and can not only speak on its importance, but you know, help give resources and advice and just tell people how to navigate through like the mental health situations, we would like to have you on Monday. Tuesday, it's political Tuesday. Respectfully, it is campaign season right now. If you're running for an office and you're not taking advantage of an open platform, you deserve to lose. We have a platform. We have an already gathered body. We just need you to come talk to us. Um, I don't care your affiliation. I don't care your creed. I don't care what you're running for. I just want you to get out here and give these youth the information. You could have held an office seven years ago. You could be a political science teacher. If it falls under the realm of politics, we want you on Tuesday. Next week, we actually have a lawyer, um, a young black man born and raised in Wilmington, went to Chapel Hill, went on to study at Duke. He's coming back to talk to us on Tuesday. A beautiful, come back home, talk to the people. Wednesday, it started out as Women of Color Wednesday, but when we began in June with the, the talks, I realized that there's a lot of individuals who do not know what Me Too is, the Me Too movement, how it applies in everyday life, work life, how it disproportionately affects people of color, women of color, and how here in Wilmington, they're not aware of the sex trafficking and the, the, the people getting thrown in shipping containers of that nature. So for June and July, we turned it into women-led Wednesday. So we have women's stories and we can hammer in me too and educate them and prepare them, not scare them, but scare them enough that they're aware. In August, it's going to go back to women of color because women of color need their own platform. Um, I do apologize for the misadvertisement because of the shift, but it is a woman-led platform and it will become women of color in August. So I want women of color speakers, powerful women, just to come and talk to us and share and help us women navigate through the world. 
Thursday, it's a block party because in the state of the world, you have to have a reason to celebrate. You have to remember to laugh and join. And so we literally just play music all day. So we're looking for different DJs, someone who wants to come spin on the turntables. We've got all the equipment. We just want you to show up and come jam with us. Nice. Friday is our artist Friday. So self-proclaimed artists. I'm talking about the spoken words. I'm talking about the visual artists, the dancers, the, the beat makers, you know, come out here and share your story, how art saved your soul, why art should be back in education, why the schools need to be showing more art, come in and share your art. We've had live bands come out there and just jam with us all day because that is art in itself. Um, we have a lady who wants to come and teach salsa classes. Um, there's a couple of UNCW students who want to set up craft tables and you literally just sit there and like make jewelry, like that type of anything. Community day is Saturday and Sunday. So we are literally going into the community doing things, yard work. Um, we're working on repairing some of our neighbor's houses. Uh, there's a lady who's actually getting leaks inside of her house finally addressed and they've been there for three years apparently. But we have some of our communities going in and doing that. So uh, and Sunday, Sunday is our spiritual entity day. So it's all religious aspects. They're invited to come and talk. Again, we do not want you to convert us. We just want you to come and educate us and show us the different options that are out there. So we have seven different platforms, so many openings. And I want to go beyond just Wilmington, you know, show other cultures and talk to other people. But at all point and all days, it's a place to highlight the minorities. So I'm seeking the educators and seeking the information givers. Because like I said, I've got an audience. I have a need. I just don't have the knowledge myself. So if all I can do is just connect and point people, then that's what I want to do. Very nice. I really, I love that. I love that. And right now I'm already thinking of people that I'm going to yes. be telling about you. I know lawyers, I know mental health counselors, yes. I know advocates, I know DJs, I know all this kind of stuff. So yes. Yes. I want them all. If start, yeah. If you start seeing me tag people, you know, I'm tagging them to, for them to reach out to you um, and be a part because Wilmington's only three hours away. So it's yes. not like they have to have this experience. And if we need to, we have <laughs> donations and we have some connections with some community members who have Airbnb. So we will put mm -hmm. you up. We just want you yeah. to get here. We're not asking yeah. you to get your own hotel. We'll, we'll get you a hotel. Just come here. These people want knowledge. I want the knowledge. There's so much that I don't know. Come. Yeah. We'll get yeah. you a place to stay. The community will feed you. You'll eat dinner with us. Just get yeah. to what yeah. in. Well, and awesome. it's prepared um, because of COVID. We can zoom you in. We have projector yeah. capabilities. So we, we can do the technological thing too. Great, great. Well, I definitely want to talk to you about coming on Wednesdays. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but I remember when we met, it was so much going on. You probably don't remember, but you might, um, that I'm a domestic violence and sexual assault advocate. So I would definitely love to come out on Wednesdays and talk about domestic violence and, um, you know, share some statistics there in Wilmington and in North Carolina specifically, because North Carolina has one of the highest traffic rates um in the u.s it does. yes and as charlotte is the highest in north carolina they're saying for um domestic violence so it'll be great for me to do some research and find out about wilmington so definitely would love to come down there on a wednesday um and uh share for I your love to have an african-american woman come and say that yes. a woman of color we've had a couple of um of what are, are white educators and again i'm super appreciative Right. Wilmington is very rich in white people. Yes. White people know <laughs> shit. Thankfully, yes. they are coming from an educator stance and they do address yes. that. They say, this is not my platform. I'm only coming at you with the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yes, ma'am, I would love more women who look like the people we're talking to, who, mm -hmm. who, have, who need a platform for so often, they don't get that chance. Right. I would definitely, yes, we will definitely connect on that. And I'm, again, I already have a list of names of people that I think will be damn I don't know what happened. That was me. <laughs> but anyway, we're here. There's no reason why anybody should be hungry or homeless or 
or so forth and so on, that they all work together. It's, it's not surprise, not just for one for one organization, it's for everybody to get together. So um, yes, thank you for sharing that. That was very, very, very important. We have gone over our time, but if you're willing to do the nine minutes, I would love to do the nine minutes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we would start at 8.45. This is how we did our meeting because at the time we had our nine o'clock curfew. So we'd start at 8.45. So this would get us done at 8.53 with seven minutes left to clean up. Um, the, what we would go through is um, on the, the minute mark, we would start with, I'm through. My stomach hurts at the eight minute mark. My neck hurts at the seven minute mark. Everything hurts at six minutes. I need some water at five minutes. Please, I can't breathe at four. They are going to kill me at three. Don't kill me at two. And mama, mama, I can't at one. And then when the buzzer would ring at zero, we would hold and more often than not, we would say together we rise and we would all get up. Um, when we would start the nine minutes, I would ask everyone to take a knee or everyone to kneel because those nine minutes being on your knee on the concrete was just marginally uncomfortable. And I would always bring it back around. I could not imagine the, the level of discomfort, not only that the world was feeling, he was feeling, but if you can sit there and bear that for nine minutes and you can take this and further it, you can take this message and further it, you can take the sentences and reiterate them and make sure someone else hears them. Yes, yes. Um, I think that's, when I got emotional was during that nine minutes because I'm like, these were his words. And I can tell you now, I can't get down on my knees for anything and get back up <laughs> very easily. So um, I did participate and I think halfway through, I had to straighten myself up because I deal with chronic pain in my legs. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it became very emotional for me. And even now talking about it because you are putting those that are there at the protest or, or that are supporting you in that moment that Mr. Floyd was going through. And of course, not to the extreme, but just the uncomfortability of kneeling on concrete. And it was hot when we were there. Just imagine Mr. Floyd on the ground with that officer kneeling or his knee on his throat, um, hot. I, I can't, I, I, I can't imagine, you know? And what if that was my dad? Cause he had children. What if, that was my son. What if that was my husband, my best friend, your partner? My nephews, my nephews, yes. My brother, what if, it, what if it was any man that I knew in my life, like I knew on a first name basis. And the fact the fact that the last thing that he, he did, he called out for his mother and his mother had died two years prior. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the nine minutes, and that was my first time hearing uh, the whole, you know, the dialogue at, at uh, on the front porch. Um, that was my first time hearing it. But when you said that about, he called out to his mama. I instantly thought of my son. And I can't imagine what his mom is suffering through. But one thing I can say as a mom is knowing that my son was crying for me would have been devastating for me. So I, I just can't imagine. Oh, okay. thank you for the information. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. And if anyone has a heart, 
if anybody has any sense of compassion for human beings, regardless of their, their race, I can't see how that and hearing that does not move you or motivate you to be a part of something that changes the way our boys and our men and our race and culture are being treated. The system is on violence. We, we have got to stop systemic violence. We have got to wake up to the fact that racism is real and it is fueled by violence. The system is built and structured to support violence. We as a people have become desensitized to violence. So we need to retrain ourselves. We need to recondition ourselves. We need to turn our moral compass up. We need to inundate ourselves in healthy practices. We, we need to go back to communicating. We need to The violence has got to stop across the board. Violence is violence is violence. And somehow, some way, we've got to unite and agree that enough is enough. I don't care what kind of violence you're fighting against. Violence has got to stop. And and I'm not, you know, one of these peace, love, and happiness hippies, you know, because there's a time and a place, but the level of violence that we have become accustomed to and that we have allowed to get this far to the point that we watched a man die for nine minutes on live TV or live feed or live whatever the hell you were watching. If that didn't jar you and motivate you to move, you are part of the problem. You are part of a violent system. You need to be held accountable for your violent acts that you're encouraging. You are the issue. And I, I will say, I don't care who you are. Like again, race, creed, color, class, I don't care if you are complacent and encouraging in that level of violence, you're part of the problem. I agree. I agree. And I don't, I'm going to let that be our closing for tonight. Um, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so, so much. Having me. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, I'm very proud of you. Can I ask your age? I'm an actor. So I'm going to keep that to myself. Um, okay. I know you're I younger than me. Cast. I'm 43. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be cast. Um, I want to be cast. In no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm actually 33. Okay. Well, I'm you're young. I know people don't believe that <laughs> I say it. I'm like, I'm 30. So they're like, wait, no, you're not. You're like 28. And I'm like, sure. I, I, am, I am 28 plus. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you for taking the time. Um, I know that you're very busy. I know that you know, you're probably supposed to be on the front porch right now of City Hall. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time. Um, this will not be the last time we have you. Um, I definitely want to schedule to come down there in August. Um, I also will refer some people to you to come out to talk to you um, in Wilmington. I have a list of people in my head that are scrolling right now <laughs> that I want to connect you with. Um, and I just, I believe in what you're doing and the fact that mm -hmm. it's relatable and you could be in my family. <laughs> <You're a little laughs> <Makes sister>. better. <laughs> like my, my cousin, long lost cousin somewhere. Um, so I'm very proud of you and I'm mm -hmm. glad that we stopped, even though I was a little, a little, little cautious a little scared, but intrigued. Um, I'm glad that we did. And I met a beautiful woman and you're gonna do great things. The lowercase letters, is, leaders, sorry, is gonna do great things. And I just wanna end on this, that you are making a lot of waves there in Wilmington. So please be safe. And the fact that the police officers or the police department is acting the way they are shows that what you're doing is for a purpose there needs to be change. They should be supporting you and there every day. Because it's their city. They're there to protect it. So why have a problem with people that want to change for the good? So I really appreciate you. And um, we will see you again very, very soon. I promise. Thank you. Have a, night, have a good night. And everybody, thank you so much. Please share this. The lowercase leaders, they are made 
of the community for the community from the community. Remember, she said, this is not about me when I met her and nothing on this interview said, this is my organization. This no. is a community organization. So please share this and please support them. How can we find you um, and get in contact with the lowercase leaders? Um, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. We have a <laughs> page. Um, it is the lowercase leaders, all in lowercase letters. <laughs> so um, we are, we are, like I said, not reinventing the wheel. We're trying to connect the axle to the wheel so the car can keep moving. Um, yes. You can Facebook us, you can email us. Um, it's about at the lowercaseleaders.com if you need our direct email, it's um, all general information. Our Facebook Messenger gives you an automated reply that says if you need an immediate request, send an email. But I have been more active on the Messenger, so I'm replying a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, it's just the lowercase leaders at any social media, that's where we're at. Right, right. Thank you so much. We will see you again soon. And I appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Bye. Bye.